this, all right. Good afternoon, good afternoon. Today is Tuesday, June 27, 2023, the last week of June, um, about a week after the summer solstice. Welcome to the last installment of podcast series, Mother's Oh, Mother's Milk. I think I got it right this time. Um, I'm with my guest, my wonderful guest and colleague and friend, Laurie Lumby. And I am your hostess, Dia of the Cosmogenia. And today we are going to be talking about Raphael Patai's work, The Hebrew Goddess. And it's going to be, it's unscripted. Uh, not like the rest of them were really scripted. We had some guidelines for the last three, but this one is completely uh, live and raw. Um, it's coming off of uh, a, a semi-visionary experience I had 24 hours ago, not even 24 hours ago, 12 hours ago. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not well-versed in the you know biblical hebrew or the hebrew language the alephs of 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 the hebrew uh, language um and if i'm mispronouncing anything just please correct me because um that's how i learn that's how we all learn and so i have glory that's a little more experienced with that she can help to be a sounding board because what i'm about to share is just going to be like wow that's that's so fascinating um if it triggers you, I just in, I invite you to check in and explore why why it's triggering. Uh, these are stories and experiences that are firsthand empirical. I think it's the academic term, <laughs> firsthand experience, um, and this is how stories emerge. This is how narratives emerge. This is how worldviews are created. It comes from within. And then some decide to codify it and become rigid with it, and others just allow it to naturally fold, unfold and flourish. So without further ado, this is the text that we are going to be exploring and <laughs> giggling and laughing and, and talking about. Um, I've got some tabs on the side. So before I even get into how I got this book, Laurie, would you like to say a few words about today's today's topic and your familiarity with it? Sure, thank you. Um, I, first of all, I'm never going to claim to be a scripture scholar or a Hebrew scholar or a, or a Kabbalistic scholar or a language scholar or any of those kinds of things. Um, like you, resources are given to me um they just fall into my lap at exactly the right time that i need it or or in some cases years and years ahead of when i'm ready and uh then suddenly i'm able to read whatever that text was that falls into my lap but you know i have to i have to say that the beginning <clears throat> of discovering Patai's work came a couple different ways. One was, and this was years and years ago, like 1990s, I discovered these two little prayer books and I can't remember the name of them. Um, I don't remember the author, but both of them were, if I remember correctly, Catholic women scholars who had connected with the divine feminine in the Hebrew Christian tradition. And they wrote these three little volumes of books that are um, the text from scripture that mentions the feminine deity, the definition of the name, and a prayer and a ritual. And these books are just, that was, like I said, in the 1990s. So that was 30 some years ago. And 
so there's always been in my consciousness this idea that God isn't just the old man in the sky. And in fact, the tradition that I grew up in, which was born out of Judaism, um, acknowledged and honored and worshipped a goddess, a, a feminine aspect of the divine. And the references that these women wrote about in their books, and I'll track down the names so you can put it in the, um, in the script. In the script, yeah. Um, they're irrefutable. I mean, the names are right there in scripture. And then fast forward, I this was probably four, three, four years ago, I was reading a not a book I ended up not liking at all uh, that I thought was based on really lame scholarship, but the reference list was to die for. And Patai's book was on that reference list. Ah. <laughs> and so I immediately knew I had to get the book. I'm like, I want this. I'll back that up a little bit. One of my commitments to scholarship is source material. And so I do the best that I can to find the oldest, most authentic resources on whatever topic I'm studying. I don't want um, 72 derivations of that as interpreted through 72 other people's lenses. I want, I want it from the source. And so that other book that I didn't care for and several others had referenced Patai's work. And so I immediately bought it and devoured the book. And this book is old. It's like from the 80s, I think, is the copyright. Um, hey, hey, the 67, 78, and 90. Oh, 67. See, it's even older than I thought it was. So... <laughs> Yeah, so where was this book hiding my whole life? <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's, I that's love, my uh, endorsement of Patai's profound scholarship. And he also, I think he challenges a lot of, um, I think his work challenges some of the archaeological conclusions that have been drawn especially as it relates to um, uh, mother, mother goddess statuary and things like that. So I'm, in addition to uh, Rianne Eisler's work, I'm really grateful for his work and kind of setting the story straight and saying, nah, we have to stop interpreting this through a, a patriarchal lens because in mm -hmm. fact, this is the mother and the mother way predates the father, yeah. I love your reference to in scholarship with regards to source material because that's that's a big thing, right? Yeah. I'm in a current uh, critical reading and writing course, and the goal is to get us to have a lit, like a mini lit review for our dissertation. And so one of the classes, each class we, we go over APA standards. I, just, I don't like APA. I prefer Chicago. Anyway. And she talks about sources and yeah. she says, yeah. if what you're reading, if an article or a text or a study you're reading quotes or references someone else, go to that source instead of quoting the person mm -hmm. that you're reading, because they could be misinterpreting, you know, mm -hmm. the original source. And that's the main thing. It's the, the interpretation, yeah. right? Um, because she's have it, she's had instances where some of her students misinterpreted an interpretation mm -hmm. and the person that interpreted their source misinterpreted the the original source yep. so it was a double misinterpretation and you know the person that wrote that the original source they're like that's not what I meant right <laughs> right so understood so that's very important in research uh, of course academic research has their own thing you're not doing research when you're reading you're just reading but research means exactly that yep. so research as it is defined it's always important to go to the source yeah not just rely on 
someone's interpretation because it could be a misinterpretation. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you for mentioning that. And I came across his book during the pandemic because, and that was 2020. Yes, <laughs> 2020. <laughs> like when was it? Funny how we just block those three years out. Yeah. <laughs> it's all a blur. It's a blur. It's like a, a dream, right? Yeah. Um, I that was when Ashera Ashera mm -hmm. was very prominent. When she just kept coming up to mm -hmm. both me and my mother, and it was this book that seem to be the best one. I, there's another one. I have the cult of the cult of Ashera and early Judaism or something like that. It is okay. But mm -hmm. this, like, you know, where the little tabs are, it was just like, oh, there's some things in here. I kind of, I, I want to get into. So last night, was a very interesting night. I was focusing on doing an assignment because I missed the class. Mm -hmm. And so as it's playing in the background, mind you, I had I had a five to five gummy. It wasn't, and usually nothing happens. It just kind of just puts me in a relaxed state. And I always welcome information. Um, but at that moment last night there were some things that came up the day before that I didn't have clarity on and I was just like no I need more information without doing a full-blown journey like you got to give me more like give me some more give me some more <laughs> um so the recording is going you're talking about APA and they get to personal communication how do you cite personal communication and that mm -hmm. is when the downloads happen as if it was a full-blown journey for me. Mm -hmm. So for a full-blown journey, I need, I, at this point, I only need like 10 milligrams of THC for a full-blown. Before I would, gosh, be like upwards of 25 <laughs> just to like get there. But last night, five and five, you know, it was, was pretty, it was pretty mellow. And I felt a lot came through, but what, what stood out the most was feeling the source mother. She just like, mm. I just felt her presence. And when I know that she's kind of peeking in is when in my mind's eye, I see a female form. Mm. Oh, so it's opaque in color. It's neither, it's a female form, but it's all that is. It's not woman. It's not man. It's in yeah. a female, but it's, it's all, all mm -hmm. that is, comes through. And she's repeating, you know, I am all that was, I am it, I am all that is, and I am all that will be. And I'm like, yeah, okay. You kept saying that, but she kept saying that Sunday night. And the thing with Sunday night, it was she, she would say it like, I am that which weaves and I am that which is woven, or I am, mm -hmm. and I am the weaver. And I'm just like stumbling over the words because I'm like, it's kind of repetitive, but I get what you're saying. You you are the creatrix, you are that which is created, and you're doing the creating. Like I get, I get that three-level mm -hmm. thing. I totally why do you keep saying it over and over? It came up again. And I was just like, okay. And then I look at the time and I'm like, oh my gosh, I got that podcast tomorrow what's the thing so I go I grab the book I just randomly open it the stuff is going on in the background and it opens up to the the Kabbalistic tetrad chapter mm -hmm. and specifically I think I said 127 in your in the email that I sent to you I was just like okay, I'm not interested in, in what this page has to say. Like, what's the relevance? Oh, let me look at the tabs that I have. So I, I pull up to the first tab and it has a bunch of underlining, you know, where he's talking about Shakti, 
and and then the little you know the the names of the divine daughter pearl precious stone and i'm like yeah i've heard some of those in my dreams okay cool but that doesn't connect to what you kept repeating so i go to the next tab and i see the first two letters of the tetragrammaton y and h mm -hmm. and then she says it again i'm all that was i'm all that is i'm all that shall be and then it hits me boom that's what that's what it is like the full mm -hmm. time that's her <laughs> so like the first part whichever the first part is is the autogenic self generative and then the the last part is the parthenogenetic creation like her daughter her the the, the twinning the continuity mm -hmm. and i wrote that note at the very top i i write it and i'm just like <laughs> i'm like reading what what patai has to say about okay um talking about de leon's uh interpretation of it and he said had he followed the indian example he would have made both children males but the fourth letter of the tetragrammaton was an h like the second one therefore it, it too had to stand for female divinity thus a son and a daughter were made from the parts of the deity that's when that was the moment where i was just like oh no it's not male female it's it's those qualities that are that are necessary for a, a, a divine being to parthenogenetically procreate mm -hmm. you know and so I, that was when i was online looking for more information because of course i i'm not familiar with um biblical hebrew even the hebrew language um and the nuance of it like sanskrit right. it's it's the whole concept in a symbol and yeah. that's how that is how they communicate they communicate through symbols they communicate through images not verbal languages right that is a patriarchal creation so then i came across the the female um, counterpart um i i'm gonna butcher it so you can you can go ahead and pronounce it if you can if you, can, <laughs> if you would please i'll try <laughs> so i i you know the was it the ehyh yeah and so when I came across that and the whole, the full term E-H-Y-H, I share E-H-Y-H. -E I'm, for those of you that are devout, please bear with me. This is, this is, this is part of my process. So something will be revealed. I typically take days, weeks, months, depending upon what it is, it could be years mm -hmm. to process it, to process that revelation. Um, so this is something I'm still processing. So like I said, this is raw. I'm processing live. Like mm -hmm. this, this is live now, but it'll be a recording when you watch it. So I'm processing this revelation, right? Mm -hmm. And so you have these two layers and you've got the, you know, the YH, VH or, or however it's pronounced. I'm, I'll get into the pronunciation when I'm comfortable. For, I'm, for now, I'm just going to do the, the English letters. <laughs> um, you have that ineffable essence of that what that which is of all that is. I am all that was, I am all that is, and I am all that shall be. Mm -hmm. You have that. And then you have like this I am that which I am like you like you have that I am statement essence and also from what I could read like that was revealed first before mm -hmm. you know, before the the YHVH so it's for me it's like wow at the core of this dogma mm -hmm. the, the origin is the story of the mother mm -hmm. the story of the autogenic being that is embodied in the female form, right? Neither male nor female, not neither man nor woman. Yeah. But the original form takes the female shape because of its 
ability to procreate from within its body. Yeah. And these are stories that are reflected across the world that honors mm -hmm. as creatrix mm -hmm. before patriarchy came, um, before patriarchy emerged. And in a lot of these matriarchal cultures, paternity wasn't even a thing because it was because the life came through the mother and women were seen as rebirthers and parthenogenetic beings <laughs> right um and yes i will say i'm quite certain earliest earliest of times that's what it was parthenogenesis because i'm speaking from past life memory i'm speaking from ancestral memory i'm speaking from the dreams that i've had um Maybe there's some archaeolo archaeological things out there that I'll be able to come across and say, yeah, this, this is the story, you know, um, that humanity has ignored or, or forgotten. Um, and then you have, you have the, the answered prayer of a jealous son wanting mm -hmm. the power of his mother and patriarchy came to be. So that's the story. That's the narrative that I was taught that was passed down to me through ancestral dreams. Uh, you know, everybody's at liberty to, to disagree because as we look out in the cosmos, there are galaxies everywhere. So I look at that as differing belief system being able to be in the same space. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so I'm, I'm going to stop there. <laughs> I'm going <laughs> to Because, wow, I was not expecting, I wasn't expecting that. Yeah. That wasn't yeah. planned. Like, I don't, mm -hmm. this is why I purposely leave my books on the shelf when I journey. <laughs> Unless it's it's a, a constant knock, go get the book. But it wasn't even go get the book. It was, oh my God, I have a, I've got a podcast. Let me get the book. And that's, that's what. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> anyway well, you're, you're <clears throat> yeah, as question. you're unpacking all of that, there's a couple of things that come up. The first thing is um, there's this incredibly dense meaning, um, thank God I've already read 30 books on the Kabbalah before reading this book um, because without that background I would not be able to even begin to comprehend this book nor neither am I really comprehending it it's just like little bits and pieces of it and it's um I'll find the title and send that to you too but it's um it's a book that talks about Kabbalah and tarot and the reason I bring it up and it's Samuel something where like w-o-e-r or something like that is his last name um and the reason i bring it up is that the author mentions numerous times how human beings were originally um self-generating and self-generating as you say parthenogenic meaning just coming from within we didn't need that other that other part. And that's not to say to the men out there, we don't need you because we love and honor and celebrate you. Um, <laughs> in, all, in all aspects, you know, companionship, good company and yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, but whether that's literally true, historically true, or part of the collective narrative, because he he's drawing from literally every spiritual tradition he's drawing from Egypt India Judaism you know it's like he's pulling from all of these different um traditions bringing forth essentially the common narrative and um anyway that's the only reason I brought that up so I'll send you the name of the book and um people can be as confused as I am trying to read it um <laughs> But as it relates to the divine name, um, I think that's a good time for me to bring up my, my little handout that I felt compelled to print out as we were preparing, sort of preparing for today. Um, 
So the four letters in the, the Tetragrammaton, the four letters of the Hebrew name that is not supposed to be uttered. We're not supposed to attempt to say the name. And in fact, in the Hebrew tradition, you don't say like, I'll use the um, American interpretation of the name. It's either Jehovah or Yahweh. And that's an affront to Jewish people if you use those words. Instead, okay. that's why they use Adonai, which means Lord, or they will just say the Lord. They don't reference a name because the name is meant to be unutterable. And hence the difficulty with pronunciation, or hence the difficulty with even trying to articulate it because it's not meant to be articulated because it is a sacred seed sound language, as you mentioned. So if I can be so bold as to share what I gathered, and this is, I have to give credit for to Rabbi Michael Monk, who wrote the book, The Wisdom in the Hebrew Alphabet. And this is, he's a um, Hasidic Jew, and he's giving a deep spiritual reflection on the individual letters of the Hebrew alphabet. And it's through that deep, kind of deep reflection that we can better understand Hebrew words and what they're trying to say. So if we just took, uh, let's say we had the Dead Sea Scrolls and we could just translate it blind into English, we're not even going to come close because it's missing all the nuances of the sounds. So the Tetragrammaton is made up of four letters, yod He vav He. From Rabbi Michael Monk, his uh, this is his interpretation of those four letters. Yod means the indivisible, unified purpose and existence, the symbol of creation of what is and the world to come. Yeah. Hey, which we see twice, um, you will love this in your birthing work. Hey means the mere exhalation of breath, the effortless enunciation which created the world, the world that is, femininity, gen gentility, limitless mercy, there is always an opening to the divine. And that brings up um, the Hebrew letters, in addition to being seed sounds, are also came out of an agrarian culture. And so the letters tend to represent something agricultural. And the letter hey represents, uh, let's see if you can see it. So this is the hay that represents a house with an open door or a house with an open window. And so it's saying there's always space for the divine to enter. There's always space for the divine. Vav, which is the third letter, represents the symbol of completion, redemption, and transformation. It unites seemingly opposing concepts. It is the link between this world and the next. It represents and facilitates complete inner harmony. And then we have another articulation of hey, the mere exhalation of breath, the effortless enunciation. It's all about that creation from within. I am like getting chills as you're speaking i would really love the the name of this person that that did that interpretation all the all the things you're going to be giving me i'm saying it again so that because we're all going to be expecting it inside the, yep. the description <laughs> as you're saying and this is divine timing is
this is this explains why I experienced what I experienced Sunday like so mm-hmm. the, the stories of the seven mothers it's it's a world thing mm-hmm. there are cultures that see them as seven men I'm, I'm not going to argue with that whatever the case may be for the cultures that have them as the seven mothers as at within their their cos, cosmovision cosmology cosmo cosmogony there are different iterations of seven mothers there are seven sisters as daughters of seven mothers and then there are these seven grand mothers like two mm. separate words they are their grant their knowledge their wisdom their know all do all be all they exist cosmically and terra uh, earthly they're 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 both and Mm -hmm. they came down and i felt like i was going through a head surgery Mm. i don't yeah so sunday morning i woke up at like i don't know if it was sometime between 12 and 4 i had this painful migraine that started at the base of my of my skull at the top of the spinal column um and I had just gotten off my period Friday so back ends if you don't um hydrate enough or get enough rest you're I know I'm gonna get a headache also I just got back from a very intensive conference on Friday and then Saturday I had to wake up early go to birth work training and then I ended up at the car dealership afterwards so no I didn't give myself a break or rest mm-hmm. Sunday had that migraine woke up had fixed myself uh Himalayan pink salt and water solution <laughs> I did take a Tylenol because I was like I want I want all the things I was like give me all the things mm-hmm. um essential oil blend that that I do for for migraines specifically um did an inhaler for it put it on my hands put it back there hot water bottle was nice and warm but as a compress and then Reiki <laughs> Yep. <laughs> this, sounds, this sounds so familiar. <laughs> like, like, like half the bottle and I'm laying there drinking, you know, hydrating, administering Reiki and 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 the, the compress. I empty my bladder, I come back, I drink again, I empty my bladder, reinforce the Reiki, and I just fall asleep and I wake up fine. It's it's completely gone. That night I'm like, I'm I'm gonna journey. The seven grandmothers come down and I'm like, they're communicating, but they're Mm -hmm. not verbally speaking. And each time they open their mouths, it's sound waves, like like Mm a circle, like sonar. If you're looking at a sonar and how it pulses and, and rings, that's just what was happening. And it would hit my brain. And I'm like, I'm like, oh my goodness like ow it hurts because mm-hmm. it's rewiring and re reorientating reorienting and, and all the all of whatever it is that they were doing I felt their fingers go in through the back like right where I had the migraine I was like that's why I had a migraine because you started working mm-hmm. clearing and and rewiring so they did that for hours and it got to a point where I I made popcorn and I started eating because I was like, I'm, I need to ground myself. I don't want to do this anymore. Mm-hmm. I, was like, <laughs> I was like, I'm checking out. I'm done. And yeah. they, didn't, they didn't like that. They just kept going. And so I, I had to, I had to deal with it because I couldn't say no. That's right. just when people are like, you have a choice. And I'm like, you got creative license when you've got something specific to do on earth, but the only time you have your own choice is when you're learning. And I, I call it basic lessons, mm-hmm. but they're profound lessons for you because that's where you are. If you're in ceremony and you're thinking, oh, I'm going to choose to stop because I have that control, like lucid dreaming. No, absolutely mm-hmm. not. That's not how it works. And they were like, no. So I was just eating, I was eating, eating popcorn and trying to do all sorts of other things on myself. It wasn't working. Like I was just being bombarded by their language. Yeah. They were teaching me their language and it hurt. So I said, 
I know if that doesn't work, I'm going to go to sleep. And so I went to sleep. I was just like, I'm, I, I, I couldn't handle it. I really yeah. couldn't. It was overwhelming. Yep. Um, of course, spirit is not, they're not going to, you know, attack me and be like, oh, you horrible right. child. We're going to keep working through you. Mm -hmm. That's, that's what, that's what was happening. You know, to yeah. micro dose was like me becoming aware of what was already going on. Yeah. And so I say all of that to come back to how this rabbi, correct? Worked yeah. through, through each letter and, and hearing you explain that it helps me to understand how from my understanding one set is that ineffable all that is and the second set is a reflection of that so deeply connected to mm -hmm. right that and that's why for me and in my understanding now right as I am in my processing why well, they both end in each Mm -hmm. right and yeah. so it's it's a reflection and it, it just goes back to the name of of my of my tradition Hitawi, the house of two lands above mm -hmm. and reflection of each other one emerged out of the other yeah. right the, the 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 manifest world is a reflection of the in, in manifest uh, of the mm -hmm. intangibles intangible birthing the tangible with the the identifier the h mm -hmm. as, as that visible connecting anchor so that's how i understand the sacred name to be and that's how i guess i'll be working with it um i'm gonna invite you to to reflect on that if you have anything to add while i see if i can find these images that I started doing as a healing process in 2012, where some of the script looks related that, that you can say yeah. that the Hebrew that looks Arabic, uh, there's something there. So they're all related. <laughs> yeah, they're related. Sure. I want to look for it to see if I can do a screen share just, just so that everyone can yeah, see. Yeah. Oh my gosh, music. Hold on a sec. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so if you if you have anything you, you, you'd like to share or or reflect on. I no, I just I it. love how um through your own reading and process, you intuitively came up with the essence of what is academically articulated through Rabbi Monk, for example. And, you know, it's I, the piece that just keeps coming back to me is the breath, the breath, the breath. And, you know, I think of that in so many different ways. I mean, there's, um, well, the first thing that comes to mind is the, the story of the creation of human beings in Genesis and God breathed the breath of life into them. And there's something so intimate about that. And it's, you know, it's, it's saying that the breath of God, the breath of the divine, the breath of the creator is within us. And we are that breath and we are that breath living and breathing all day, every day. And, you know, there's, there's such an intimacy with that. And, and I think that's why probably perhaps why, or there was an intuitive wisdom that was gathered by the ancient yogis, for example, that understood that connection with breath is our way to remembering connection with breath is our way to union with self with creator with each other and and you think about all of the different intimacies related to breath like you think of kissing you know kissing is sharing a breath 
and and in true authentic love you are sharing breath and you're sharing presence and you're sharing being and you're sharing it's just I love it and and it also brings to mind you know the birthing work that you're preparing you're doing and preparing for and how you know in that act of bringing forth life how the breath helps to facilitate that and helps to support that process and um you know on the other end of the threshold I think of breath death and you know it's when when the soul departs the body it leaves in that final breath it's just like and it's gone and it's just there's so many layers to that and um that's just what came came through and and the um you know i am who i am which is past present future and everything everything yeah. mm-hmm. everything I love that you touched upon death and life in the same moment because mm-hmm. it was um, Spanish, uh, the Spanish colonizers called giving birth um, dar la luz or dando la luz, giving the light. Mm. So it's not even translated as giving birth. It's giving the light, right? Or mm. to give the light. And in in a visionary, in a dream, it was a dream. Like I, I went to sleep, you know, no entheogens, no nothing. They revealed, the mothers revealed how to set the space, how to cleanse the space at a birth. Like literally what to use. And revealed like, the dance or the ritual to to do to do during birthing Mm -hmm. is to help with that pillar of light to help anchor Mm -hmm. the pillar of light i didn't know about the whole pillar of light during birth i excuse me i go hiking with a a a midwife Uh, she's she's a seasoned doula but she's also she's doing midwife training not to get certified Mm -hmm. but for the training right right and I, we go hiking at South Mountain in, in South Phoenix and in the parking lot before it gets too hot. This is like at like eight o'clock in the morning. <laughs> so we went early just to mind you or just to keep that in mind. It's almost eight o'clock and it's already 90 degrees. Um, I say to her, I, I tell her what was revealed. She was like, oh, down the la luz. And I was like, I didn't capture it at that time. So I get home and I text her and she sends it, dando la luz, giving the light. Mm. She had said that. I was like, oh, here's, there's a thing. Of course there's a thing, but there's a thing that yeah. I, I need to be more aware of. And as I'm sharing this with my mother, I see you know, on the, on Instagram, one of the Olympic runners died in childbirth because she, she didn't trust the medical mm-hmm. system. So she did it at home and she died in childbirth. And immediately I was like, that's the portal of life and death. Mm-hmm. Like that's, that can be an exit for both the mother and child. Mm-hmm. And it's an entryway for all ancestors. Mm-hmm entryway and an exit like in that moment both life and death exist they're not it's a transition right it, there's and so even with the birthing of a child it could be the transition of just the body because the soul decided it didn't want to it just wanted to experience mm-hmm. the trip and that's it right and so i was like wow that's amazing birth work class this past Saturday and we talking and and the one of the the facilitators she's a midwife a death midwife and she's like in that same moment is birth and death and I'm like I'm sorry I just wanted to raise my hand and share my experience because you're talking about this and this was revealed the week before and I didn't even know that you know they switched the topics for last this past Saturday so I was like I didn't know you were going to talk about it 
And so it's that breath yeah. is life. And we look at ancient Egypt at the Ankh. It's mm -hmm. the key of life. It's that breath where they're always, it's here. So mm -hmm. I just, I'm, I'm, I'm just like, this is awesome. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So I, I found the images and I want to do a screen share so that oh, good. Um, you can see it and, you know, everyone that watches it can, can see it as well. So I'm just going to share just that. Can you see? Can you see pictures? Right now I'm seeing a black screen. You're just seeing a black screen. Oh, there okay. we go. I see these now. Okay, cool. Let me bring this up here. Okay, so are you seeing the picture? I'm seeing the whole file. So if you click okay. on one picture, that'll bring up the one picture. Otherwise, I'm seeing the whole file. So oh. all uh, 10 images that you've got here. Okay, yeah. Okay, so I, yeah. Let me stop share because I brought up I just, I clicked on one image and <laughs> let's try this again. Now, what do you see? Uh, there it is. I see it now. Yep. Okay. Yep. So as you can see some of the swirls here and there, it looks like a mixture of, you know, it looks like a mixture of Arabic and there we go. At yeah, the very totally. Bottom, totally. Right? Yep. And so this one was one of my favorites. I This one, I used a short canvas and acrylic. Um, this symbol right here is just one of my favorites. I remember in some of my scrap papers, just constantly doing this image, doing these little you know, these little flurs right here at the top is just one of my favorites to do consistently and constantly. And then of course you've got some other creative iterations here, but this for me was uh, just a language. Like I was just like, it's a language that means something that cannot be spoken. Like I can't give you a verbal indication of what they meant yep. but I know they meant something and it had to do with world building because these lines here these lines here represented like like citadels cities sacred yep. Yep. city sacred spaces and these steps here it's like um breaking apart um like breaking apart dimensions to go through yep. dimensions if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And so drawing these lines on, on the, you know, the longer part of the, um, for uh, the horizontal line, drawing these vertical lines was like drawing cities. So like this here represented a world and this here mm -hmm. represents a world. Um, and all of it was just these, these individual glyphs i'll just call them glyphs mm -hmm. um, represents a concept and the lines on them represent the worlds that they 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 represent or mm -hmm. if that makes sense so yep. i did all of this in 2012 these were done in 2012 um during a healing process i was uh, severely anemic because i was in china for a year and i was sick the whole time and because i didn't recover the way my body needed to, um, I I was experiencing severe hemolysis, and being G6PD deficient just meant I did not. I, I had I kept engaging all the triggers that would destroy my red blood cells faster than my body can remake them, and therefore I became extremely sensitive. And where I needed like a I needed a, a dark room pretty much for mm -hmm. a couple of months to just heal. Um, and I think by the third month I started playing with, with sketching and these images. And it was just, it was, what I love about this one is that 
you see the like the blur with the with the black as if um, yeah as if there's light light shining from this corner Mm -hmm. yeah that I I don't I don't I was just working with spirit the spirit was just working through (laughs) just working through me um and that's that's pretty much what it is I um and I just got really creative with pastels and and the pastels is just like the fluid movements in a sense Mm -hmm. Um, I'm trying to get this thing down here to go away it's not gonna go away and so it was me just playing with more Mm -hmm. and so this this is you know the mountain in the background but you have you know the the words of creation I guess on top of it superimposed so that was my my understanding this this is just like creative process that I kind of just kept to myself um but yeah that's that's this is this is what where it kind of looks Arabic but it's not (laughs) yeah yeah like a, a secret, a sacred language that doesn't have a verbal component because it, it can't be spoken. Like there is no, there is no way to, to verbally speak it. There's, it's, it's a vibration that's, that can be hardly articulated, <laughs> if that makes sense. Right, absolutely. Um, I, this image here, I called it the silver tree because that's, you know, you see the, the tree branches up top. This is the, the trunk here in the middle. And these down here are the roots, but then over the roots, you have the glyphs of, of creation mm-hmm. in gold, right? So the silver is the manifest and, and the gold is, is the, the brilliance of the unmanifest of, mm. of that sacred light. So this is, this was part of part of my my process. It's what yeah. you know, what I what I did. So when it when I started looking, I think I, I went to go um, pawn some jewelry because that's I didn't have a job at that time. I was still recovering, and I couldn't handle being around people for quite a while. Um, just enough to go pawn off some some gold jewelry. They had a. They had a chart in there that had Hebrew letters on it. And when I looked at it, I was like, that's almost like my drawings. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I was just so excited because it it, it looked related and, and, and yeah. similar. Um so yeah, I just wanted to wanted to share that because love that when we're talking about you can't not speaking the name. I, I understand that. Like there there is no correct way in the human tonal language to to correctly speak it because when the mothers were talking I was just like I can't even tone it I can't I can't Mm -hmm. make create that Mm -hmm. tone but I understood (laughs) I understood and I I can't even articulate what it was so there's that quality of knowing yeah cannot be spoken because it cannot be spoken. Yeah. Yep. So any it. any reflection on that? Welcome to share. Just um I'm glad to meet a crazy person that writes in spirit language. <laughs> uh because well, you're not crazy, but um that's a practice that comes through me every now and again is spirit language. And it's more um, like complete written texts. And um, I just know it's something that has to come through me and it's by allowing it to come through me, it's going out in the world somehow. And, you know, similar to when I find myself speaking in tongues, you know, it's just, these utterances are coming out and you can't control it. It's just pouring out of you. And you know that it's just, it's just there to transform whatever it is here to transform. I don't know what that is. And I don't need to know what it is. It just, 
And um, sometimes in Reiki, when I'm working with a client and, you know, I reserve this for the clients that I've known a long time and I know can handle it. <laughs> is every once in a while that spirit language will come through me and it's, you know, meant to break up blocks, uh, restore balance, whatever it's adding and facilitating that healing process in a way that's perfect for the receiver. And I just trust it. Um, and I totally agree. A lot of your letters look exactly like Hebrew letters. And I definitely see an Aramaic reflect or uh, Arabic reflection there. And uh, yeah, it's, it's one of the reasons I'm so fascinating, fascinated with, um, I don't have, unfortunately, I don't have the gift of learning foreign language. Um, I know a little bit of French, um, but it just is not, it's not my, it's not my gift. Um, mm -hmm. But I love exploring ancient languages like Hebrew, Aramaic, um, and to just understand where the language came from, how it came to be, what are its origins, um, how do these sounds reflect meaning, and Aramaic is similar in that regard. And um, how can we better understand a culture by studying their language? And how can we better understand our own language? You know, with Sanskrit in particular, um, the English language has its roots in Sanskrit. And, you know, it, it freaks me out when I hear, it doesn't freak me out anymore, but when we understand the connection between the Sanskrit word and its meaning and an English word that has its, that's reflective of that Sanskrit. And something to add to your Irish ancestry um, brain explosion, there are specific words shared between Irish Gaelic and Sanskrit. And I'm yeah, surprised. no surprise. I'm, not surprised. I'm glad to, and I'm glad to hear it as well, because there was a specific Gaelic word that came to me while I was in Ireland. I was like, I, does this even exist? And it, it does. And it has to do with the mother. I, I have to, I, 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 I literally have to Google it. I, I would butcher it if right. I tried I try to speak it um and it also clarifies why some words would be revealed to me in dreams in sanskrit yeah. and i'm like y'all don't have a specific verbal language you just, <laughs> just coming through with these images that convey a concept that right. have been translated into a verbal mm -hmm know comprehensive not even completely comprehensive but just like a verbal tag yeah. of this deep concept truly truly means it. like it takes it takes a dissertation to understand one yeah right? exactly <laughs> so and and I agree learning language is I mean I'm I'm if it has, if it's connected to the work, then I'll retain it. Like right. I, I have to see how it's, how it's connected. And if it's yeah. actually necessary for me to learn, right. You know, for this yeah. lifetime, um, which is why I don't, I don't speak Japanese fluently after 15 years of watching anime. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't watch anime in dub. I watch it in, in its right. own, its original language with the titles right right I know some words are in there but still I, I and I can't read it like I, I just yep. can't because for me I look at the Japanese and, and the Chinese written language and I see stories yep that not 
translated to that's not translated in, into English. Like I see how you know what I mean. Like I actually see oh, yeah. this, like with the like with the comedic hieroglyphs or the 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 Medunet Jer. Like I see stories like the pot. It yeah. represents something specific, not a letter, right? To right. me. So learning language, like I learned Spanish, that's probably the only language I would be able to pick up again if I'm dropped in the Spanish speaking culture yep. where very little English is spoken, like it'll come back. Right. Um, and then if I needed to learn Italian, I know I'd mix numbers and things up because I, I already started doing that when I was in Italy. But to, to say I'm going to go learn this language because I want to be multilingual I would be, I, I would struggle at it because mm -hmm. it, I, for me, it has to connect to, to the work. And mm -hmm. if it's going to connect, I have to learn. I would have to learn Farsi. Yep. I would have to learn Hebrew. I would have to learn you know, Sanskrit. Like I, yep. I have to learn the ones that have the pictures. <laughs> that have the right? Right picture. <laughs> the symbols. Like I, I, yes. I because that is how they speak. They speak yes. in symbols. They don't, that's how they communicate. They don't necessarily, they can use a verbal language, but yeah. their original language is symbols and symbolism. Right. And so if you want to understand your dreams, you have to understand the language of the one mm -hmm. that invented the dream, which is again symbols. Yep. So <sighs> <laughs> all that to say. <laughs> learning another language would be would be difficult because of that reason like it yeah. has to be oh it has to be a symbolic one that yep. doesn't need sentence <laughs> subject whatever mm -hmm. subject, verb, object. it's so it's so like for example if it's like the you know the, the, the water pot and let's just use the ancient egyptian um hieroglyphs as an example the water pot you know the water and like the spiral and and an eye for me that's a whole paragraph right there and, and right it's just i'm talking about the the womb of creation that brought that pours out the waters of rejuvenation and how it's a recurring cycle and the eye you know it, it yeah. helps you see deeper into whatever whatever right so like if i see it like that it's it's recounting a story yeah <laughs> it's not this letter that letter like i i i don't understand i don't comprehend it like that and so yeah. when i do look at some texts that have the mm -hmm. the um powerless i'm looking at the concept uh mm -hmm. that's being communicated and i'm not looking at it as this is the A, this is the right the determinative, and this is has the T because whatever. No. Right. I'm right. Not how my brain works. Yeah. Probably not how their brains worked either. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I mean, if you've got these beings, these grandmother beings coming and they're just and it's just boom, boom. And I'm like, oh my gosh, what's going on? Yeah, of course. But yeah. Like they're not, they're not saying, okay, you get a pen and paper and I'm going to tell you a story and you're going to write it word for word. Right. Like, that's not, not what they're communicating. <laughs> that's not. No. no. That's not. Communicating. <laughs> no, no. So. What I found interesting, I didn't find it in this book about the um, Asherah poles. I remember the dream I had the, the yeah, dream yeah. with you about the wooden pole. Yeah. Um, it was the other text, and I'll put that inside the, the description to the cult of um, Asherah in early Israel or something like that. Mm -hmm. It talks about... Um, the poles and how it was a part of the 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 tradition before Judaism emerged and so you know coming across the letters and then going back to that and I was like 
okay so the dream it was it wasn't ground it wasn't stable it wasn't rooted like it was right. off you know its base was it wasn't connected to its base and so I guess for me I also see it as okay reconnecting you know rerouting mm. reconnecting that the pole you know the, the mother as she she once was um, do the work that I'm doing so yeah I want to say I'm excited but now I'm I'm just cautious <laughs> because <laughs> the mothers they have they have, it's their agenda and I'm yeah. I'm just the I mean, not just the vessel, but I'm just the vessel. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's Hopefully. just what it is because it's like I thought it was one thing, but no, it's something completely beyond me. Like mm -hmm. I wasn't expect. Like if you'd have told me this twenty years ago, I'd have, I'd have been turning nineteen. I'd have been like. That sounds like a lot of work. I probably would have said something like that. That sounds like a lot. Because <laughs> at 19, even though I was writing my dreams down, I'd have I'd have been like, that sounds overwhelming. Like, am I gonna get help? Like, how how is it gonna turn out? What and I would have asked all those questions. I would have I would have been hesitant. So if you'd have told me 20 years ago, if they'd have told me 20 years ago birth work but in a very specific way out of I don't think I would have lived my life yeah I would have existed with trepidation instead of fully living um and I mean having the experience of mm -hmm. losing the virginity because I wanted to mm -hmm. <laughs> in the way that I wanted to traveling wherever I wanted to quitting jobs left and right because I didn't like it like really living my life like I don't like this I want to I want to go here well I don't like I want to go to South Korea and live in South Korea well it was Japan but Japan said no um so go to South Korea I'll go live in South Korea oh I want to do whatever I want to do and I did that yeah I did yeah. that yeah we need that because I wanted to get it out of my system mm-hmm so I can be more focused. Um, but two, it added value to my, to the experience, like having those experiences adds value to, you know, what's being revealed and you know, embodied and explored. So. Yeah. I know if I had known, I don't even know when to put, okay. 1994 when the brick, red brick flew through the air and hit me in the head um if i had known then all of the things i would be made to go through in the last 30 some years i would have said no i would have said hell no i'm not doing that and i know i would have been forced to do it because we don't get to tell the mother no, like you said, um, and or I would have lived a life of great misery because I would have said no to my soul. And, you know, so I can say that now in hindsight and say I would have said no at the time if I'd known everything that I would have to go through. But at this point, now that I've gone through all of it, I'm like, I wouldn't change a thing, you know, absolutely, exactly. absolutely. It was, it has been the right path. Um, and, you know, including the challenges and what I might be tempted to call suffering or pain. And, um, you know, it's one of the things we talk about a lot in my online community is, um, you know, I no longer believe in free will. There, there is free will in the sense of, yeah, we can do what we want, but at what cost? And what are the consequences of that choice? And so we can either 
we can either allow ourselves to be carried peacefully or kicking and screaming on the path of our soul, or we suffer the natural consequence of betraying our soul. And I know enough people that have chosen to betray their soul. And I've seen what those natural consequences look like. And I won't do that. I won't do that to myself. And I wouldn't do that as a mother because there's an enormous responsibility as a parent to be a role model for our children. And so how could I sacrifice my soul if I'm wanting my children to live their soul? Like that mm -hmm. just doesn't make any sense. Um, so I'll just leave that there. I wanted to say something more about the Asherah polls, if I can. Yes, please. So I don't remember what book it was where I first learned about the Asherah poles, but the Bible kills me because every single translation that I've seen of the Bible, and so this is obviously a Christian uh, reassembly of Hebrew and Christian canonical texts, those that made the cut. Um, there is absolutely no reference to Asherah being a name, Asherah being, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Asherah being an image, Asherah being a sacred image, Asherah being an altar. It just simply says wooden pole or pole. And um, every single reference is a demand or a command that the poles be removed. And so obviously we're getting the patriarchal expression of mm -hmm. the presence of the Asherah within um, the Temple of Solomon. And it's been since then it's been proven or at least there's enough scholarship to support research to support that there was an altar to Yahweh or the yod He vav He, the I am who am the tetragrammaton and there was an altar to Asherah and at that point in the evolution of Judaism they understood the divine to be um, binary. So there was a God and a goddess and that they were equally worshiped within the temple of Solomon. And we see glimpses of that in the literature of that time, which has been attributed to Solomon, uh, specifically song of songs, the book song of songs or songs of Solomon, um, the Proverbs, which have been attributed to Solomon. And though probably he, the man Solomon never wrote any of this stuff. And the whole story in Solomon about the Queen of Sheba and how there's just this, they're all connected and it's all been translated right out. So any printed, there's no printed copy of the Christian Bible where you're going to see Asherah as a name. Um, and you have to go back to find someone that has a Jewish text that has the Aleph Shin Resh He in reference to the Asherah to even see that reference or glimpse it. And um, it just, to me, describes um, the extent to which patriarchal religion has worked to eradicate any evidence of the mother the goddess ever existed and mm -hmm. it's in every single word that or every single name that's been given to the divine in hebrew scripture um none of those feminine connotations have been uh none of those feminine connotations are described explained or 
anything. So you've got the Asherah, you've got the Shekinah, you've got um, El Shaddai, which means the breasted one, Ruah, which is the, um, the breath of God, which is a feminine term, and is you know thought of as in in some air bleh, in some specific portions of the development of Judaism ruah was the name of god and it was feminine it was the goddess you know it's kind of like the metronet that's referenced in Pataille's book and um all of that is to say that it was a decisive persistent, tenacious effort to remove the goddess. And yet she persists. And, you know, I just keep going back to the book, Miss of Avalon, where um, it's the very, I think, it, well, I know it's the end of the movie. I don't know, remember specifically if it's the end of the book, but it portrays Morgan Morgana going into the Christian church and seeing the statue of the goddess and it's being revered as mother Mary. And, you know, we look at all of these Marian um, worship sites, uh, Marian vision sites, you know, like Medjugorje, Fatima, Guadalupe. And these were all originally goddess sites and so she persists she'll find any way to be known to be seen to be honored to be recognized and you know it's just to me it's sacred sacred work that you're doing in reclaiming remembering, remembering, reclaiming, re-articulating, resurrecting the, the feminine, the mother. And we desperately need that remembrance at this point in our human evolution, or we're not going to make it as a species. I mean, it's to me, it really is that dire. Yeah. So thank you for what you're doing. Yeah. Thank you. And to add to that, um, you to erase the mother is to erase life, is to end life. Mm -hmm. So at, at the very least, that patriarchal energy knew that even wow. itself would be eradicated. It's still dependent upon. So the first revelation I received when I first started utilizing cannabis on the journey that was the first thing they revealed mm -hmm. patriarchy was created from the mother but as part of her creation and it wanted to be the mother mm -hmm. it wanted to be the creator mm -hmm. in its form mm -hmm. and it that's not how it that's not how it works, really. Mm -hmm. and so even for it to not be eradicated, because it knows I still, I'm still dependent upon the mother, yeah. but I'm going to have as much control as possible. Life flourishes. That's what mm -hmm. life is. And death is a transition from one form to another. So that is a part of life. Life and death are two sides of the same coin yep. but stagnation stagnation is a disconnect from that and that's what patriarchy represents stagnation yeah. um, and in order for it to not be annihilated it, it has to have the mother but mm -hmm. the mother requests balance and so when things get out of balance she's like all right team let's go <laughs> all right then, team let's send some orcas <laughs> oh, <right. laughs> yeah that's that's like a, a microcosmic example of what happens you harm the matriarch 
the rest of her progeny will say, these are our waters. These are, this is our territory. No, you're mm -hmm. not. Right. And it's, it's, it's just, it's amazing. It's like yeah. humans are not the only intelligent creatures on the planet. Like, yeah. come on. You've got yeah. the elephants that are matriarchal. You got the orcas, the orcas that are you got land animal and sea animal that are just like we know, we see. Yeah. We've been here a little longer than you. We've evolved in, in different shapes. You know what I mean? So it's like yep. the orcas. That's yeah. <laughs> I found out about that. I was like, no wonder I was so obsessed with orcas and and dolphins as a. As Child, that I wanted to be a marine biologist, but not to the extent of being confined to red tape. So yeah. I guess that was just the indication of, of you know, orcas, matriarchal. Hello. <laughs> Let me mm -hmm. keep that connection there. Um, but definitely it's the restoration and revitalization of ancient matriarchal wisdom. That's the work. Mm -hmm. I remember in 2012, after I got, after I healed up and relocated for a job, the mothers were like, it's a restoration project. And I didn't understand at that time. So, mm -hmm. and that's another thing. Time in that dimension is not linear. No. It, everything all at once, everything everywhere, all at once, literally yeah. like the time. <laughs> everything everywhere all at once right whereas in the physical realm we experience time as both cyclical yeah. and linear but we're so deeply conditioned to just focus on the linear aspect um they you know that's 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 what i do and birth work it's it's birth as ritual and it's rebirthing really mm -hmm. Re Birthing is is the ritual and, and the birth is the act. Um, and I'm excited about it. I'm so excited that before, the reason why I was late, you know, getting on is because I should know better by now. But the excitement of dream sharing, how could I not? I was mm. like, hey, mom, let me just share this thing with you. And of course, it turned into a whole conversation. Right. <laughs> happened. But it needed to happen because she said, do a documentary for your dissertation with your dissertation. I was like, I mean, I could essentially like my mentor is like, your dissertation doesn't have to be a written book, you know? <laughs> and I was like, well, no, there's a dance component to it. There's a performance right. as, as the evidence of showing mm -hmm. memory being transmitted, taught in the dream, and then the practice actually, you know, reemerging. She was like, do a, do a documentary of like this whole process, like how we're discussing it now, like make that as part of your documentary. And I was like, I have to figure out how to do that, but I can totally do that. She yeah, was like, totally. She was like, what about your defense? I was like, oh, it's not, it's not the cold. Every, you know, faculty is in the audience and I'm in the front, you know, it'll be over Zoom. And yeah. so- I would show part of the documentary depending on how long it is, right? Um, and then I'll speak about the research and then mm -hmm. I'll field their questions. Um, and anybody can join, really. Right. Um, you have the Zoom link. And, you know, of course, that'll be something I'll be posting on Facebook. Hey, y'all, my, my <laughs> formal. <laughs> it's called the FOR. So it's a formal oral something. I don't know what the R stands for. Um, it's on such and such date. Here's the Zoom link if you want to join. And I, I, part of me will be like, there, there are going to be some people, some people that I know that will be there. But I would be, I would be shocked if it was like a lot of people. <laughs> because <laughs> like the epitome of, of you know, Dia finish her, finishing her work. A lot of people are interested. They're like, I want to read your research. I want to read your book. Um, now it's you have a documentary a book and a performance too. <laughs> yeah, I love it. So that's, you know, that's what I'm going to take to my mentor. I'm going to say, hey, um, thinking about a documentary, mainly because another thing that came up um, is that, have you, are you familiar with Louisa Tisch? 
Oh, I know the name, but I she don't wrote, know the context. She wrote Jambalaya. She's an ocean priestess that okay. taught at Sophia University when they had their women's spirituality program. That is no more. Um, she, during yesterday when I was listening to the class recording, another aspect of what showed up was I was, I was seeing her and I having a conversation about my work, but it wasn't her. She was relaying an oracle from Oshun. She was relaying the oracle about the work and she and I were having, we were having a conversation and that was part of the dissertation. And so I was just like, and it, it came up twice. And so I was like, uh, is this my ego talking? Or is this Oshun saying, I want to have, I want to speak because that's yeah. the oracle of Oshun speaking. So I'm, I'm holding space for a few days before I reach out to her and say, hey, this is what came up. And, you know, let's set a set of time to just kind of get to know each other. Um, and I wasn't even going to mention it during here, but it, again, it's, it's in the work yeah um, that that I'm doing um one quick thing before we before we um before we end the series um Ashura and Asher or is there a connection between the two um uh, Ashura and what was the second one Asher tell me tell me what that means to you for me it's like taking the name Danu as as a as a last name, or the Anu of Anu. Uh, you know, so it's like like how they use surnames. So for me, when I see Ashura and I see Asher, I'm seeing of Ashura. Ashura. That's that mm. that I see just by looking at. Yeah. Words. Yeah. But, so. Asher, Asher as like a surname or a first name, even because I've seen the name Asher for men. Right. For yeah. Men, I've seen. And so I just wanted to know what was the connection, if any, if there is. And your thoughts. I don't, on that. I, I can't, uh, I can't speak to the linguistic language Perfect. portion of it. What I can say is that the seed sounds would be the same. Um, and that would be Aleph, Shin, Rush, and Hay. Um, and the only thing that would be missing from Asher would be the Hay. So Asherah has that, that long ah sound at the end, which is the Hay. Um, yeah, so of Asherah, perhaps. Um, I don't know. I would... It would be fun to look up the Jewish etymology of that name and see how patriarchy interprets that. <laughs> and that's, that that's it. Like how how is patriarchy interpreting that? Yeah, uh, because it's like it's almost like it's almost like woman and man. You take away the yep the woman part and you have man. So. Yeah. <laughs> and Asher or you take away the all part and you have Asher so you know, it was just a little that was like yeah was, that's interesting that's a good I'm question sure. I'm sure I just wanted to see <laughs> well this this conversation actually has put at the forefront you know the the, the tetragrammaton and like I think that's like my new assignment on top of all the other things that I'm doing right <laughs> so <laughs> and of course I'd be I, I I'd just be curious as to as to what comes up I yeah. reveal how I get to share that you know integrate it and, and share that um this has been this has been nourishing and, and revelatory thank you uh, same I also I just the way the topics flowed into each other, you know, they like they just came up, and I was like, okay, we'll just do it in this order and see see how it goes, how it flows, how it connects, and I love how it how it connects. Yeah, and I'm grateful that you've agreed to be a part of. of oh, the, uh, absolutely, absolutely. It's just been a real honor, and 
fun and you know I've enjoyed getting to know you other than um our brief uh what would we call it um commiserating in the women's room <laughs> presentation retreat center at our at our Sophia retreats <laughs> I'm like, who is this beautiful woman with the gold adornments? And uh, um, and we both share the same angst over <laughs> the things we see happening here. Um, so I've truly, truly enjoyed getting to know you better and really understanding the work that you're doing. And it's just been a profound honor for me. And you know, I can tell you, and I've shared this before, just our connecting has opened up so many things for me that um, I think have always been there, but maybe permission wasn't granted. And um, so, you know, I have, I have to thank you for that as well. So just thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're most welcome. And that thanks definitely goes to the mothers <laughs> because it, <laughs> it has an influence that works on, on all of us, yeah. you know, uh, on me, through me and um, those that I encounter. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm glad it's been fruitful and meaningful to you. And I am for our listeners and viewers, I hope this has been eye-opening, mind-blowing, nourishing, and, and challenging. I can, I invite, yeah. you know, invite the challenge just, just for you to understand that, yes, differing worldviews coming from the same seed. Mm -hmm. That's what happens in nature, you know, no, no two trees are alike, but the seeds came from the same tree-ish. You understand? Like, like yeah, yeah. You can know that, oh, yeah. but it's, and you look out, you look in the cosmos, you have a variety of galaxies that have a variety of systems within it, yet it's still in, in the cosmos. So there's space, there's space, space spaciousness <laughs> for all that is. Um, it's just an, it's an invitation to, to welcome that into your heart mm -hmm. and your, your consciousness as well. So Oh, I got to do this again sometime. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Do a revisitation and <laughs> let some of this percolate and then touch base again in the future. <laughs> yeah. You know what, with what comes up, but definitely, again, thank you so much for, you know, your patience with me getting, getting things out to you and just being really gracious with like, you know, it seems last minute, but it just flows. Like, this yeah. is what we're going to play with <laughs> the, the day of the day before. So, well, I I wish you the the best. I'm going to end, end the recording in, in a minute and then more, more thank yous at the end. Um, you can find our contact information in the description box below. Uh, my Instagram handle has changed to House of Odoo. It's pretty much just the same concept, but Odoo preferred that I use that name instead of Elishmar. Elishmar was from the Enuma Elish, you know, Heavenly Mar Sea, Heaven Sea. Odoo is the, the pot, the cosmic mm -hmm. pool. So it's the house of, of the cauldron, the house of creation, really. Um, so that's been changed. I have to update the other videos. And you know, subscribe to to keep in touch. I I won't be bombarding your playlist because I'm a full time doctoral student. Um, th this takes prior that takes priority. Um, but yeah, keep in touch. Uh, post your comments and, and questions below, and be nice, be kind. Um, without further ado, thank you again, and we'll see you in the not too distant future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.